Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Robertson, and I'm going to read a passage from Beyond Babylon by Iji Abashego. Um, the book came out in 2019 from Two Lines Press. So uh, the book is about, it's an intergenerational novel that tells the life stories of two half-sisters, their mothers and their father. And it's set in multiple places, so um, in countries like Italy, Argentina, Somalia, and Tunisia. Uh, and the story is essentially about the consequences of totalitarian rule in these countries and how how the aftermath of, you know, dictatorships and other sort of oppressive regimes um, are uh, impacting these people's lives. So I'm just going to read a, um, a short part from uh, one of the mother's perspectives. She's, Argent, um, she's Argentinian, she's a poet, her name is Miranda, uh, and she fled the, the kind of dirty war, the, mm -hmm. the military junta that was in power in Argentina in the 1970s. So um, here we go. Long hair, broad shoulders, huge strides, and the number 10 on the winner's white and blue shirts. World Cup, 1978. Argentina on the podium. The country went insane. Maybe it was, with everyone singing praises to the hippie running brazenly on the field. The newspapers showed people howling with pleasure, each goal an orgasm. The papers only showed the ones howling with pleasure. The other howlers interested no one. In fact, they did not even exist. The others were desaparecidos, brutally slaughtered off stage. The spotlight was solely for the golden boys and the military junta that had made the horror possible. Since 1976, or perhaps even earlier, people had been kidnapped, tortured, assassinated. Everything was done in absolute silence. Our ears and the world's ears were plugged, our lips sewn, our hands bound. The entirety of Argentina had been lobotomized. Argentina campeón mundial, Argentina rey del mundo, campeones gran triunfo, Argentina. Hosannas and fanaticism, the headlines all the same. The hippie, for the record, was Mario Kempes. His friends and enemies called him El Matador. Goals and orgasms, officially that's how it was. For the soldiers, the press, foreigners, the other howlers didn't count. They weren't official. Foreigners wanted the folklore, the press, heart-pounding excitement. The soldiers, laurel wreaths, self-congratulations and champagne, a shimmering cup and sharp teeth, orgasms and technicolor. That World Cup was the first one not shown in black and white. Legend has it that in the first half, Kempes was making an effort, but he didn't score. He sweated, panted, swore, but didn't score. He was dynamic like few others. On the field, he was king, but he didn't score. The whims of destiny denied him glory among strikers. The soldiers didn't like his restraint. Restraint could negate their glory, that same glory with which they wanted to deaden the conscience of us Argentinians. It was an act of miserable conceit. They pretended to be good, and we, on the other hand, pretended to believe in an Argentina that was by then a falsehood. But without Kempes's goals, the scaffolding threatened to collapse. It was up to soccer to do something. It was soccer's task. With crosses, shots on goals, extraordinary saves, it had to hide the heinous crimes the junta was uh, committing against the sensible part of the country. The white and blue team was under pressure. There were veiled threats. Menotti, the coach of, Argentine, of, of Argentina, 78, had what sports journalists call the stroke of genius. We've got to be more superstitious. You can't win without a pinch of magic. He ordered the future matador to shave his famous handlebar mustache. Smooth as a maiden, Kempes took to the field against Poland. 
It was at the Gigante de Arroyito, a stadium that felt like home. He scored a brace, and for the rest of that World Cup, he didn't stop until the end. When Kimpes scored Poland with that double goal, I'd been out of Buenos Aires for months. I was able to get away. Many Argentinians rejoiced with the team. Their dutiful orgasms had the trademark of, of a military government and the blessings of Kimpes and Menotti. The state needed imbeciles, and for that they put on that sideshow of a championship. Money flowed and blemishes were concealed, like the people who disappeared, like my brother Ernesto. Ernesto is now a number. He had a face, hair, beautiful hands. He laughed, sucking up air like a century-old combustion engine. He was a good boy, better than me, and now he is a number on a list of 30,000 desaparecidos who never came home. We didn't recover his body. To this day, they've unearthed only 20,000 human scraps, but none belong to Ernesto. I wonder how many decayed without the comfort of a grave. So many disappeared, so many dead, so many in exile. The country's finest, most principled citizens were hard hit. Along with those boys, girls, friends, new mothers, union workers, priests, and intellectuals, the whole country had disappeared. We were all desaparecidos. We couldn't speak. We couldn't discuss. We couldn't breathe. We could risk the same fate as our husbands and wives, our brothers and sisters and parents and neighbors. Everything was controlled and, out of fear, little by little, everyone began erasing themselves.